Well, that's pretty gushy. <laughs> thank you. And I would like to thank you for being asked to do this. It, this is just such a neat place. I know they talk about the echoes from the canyon, and they definitely are here. Definitely are here. This is just such a pretty place, and so many neat things have happened down here. But I want to thank you for, for asking me to uh, share with you. And uh, she said she thought there was somebody here that hadn't heard me. I haven't been bouncing around so much lately. But uh, I tell this same story, and it's like a, a good offense is a good defense. And so if you've heard this before, well, I have to tell it because I have to tell it for me about these three women that were in this uh, retirement residence. I hesitate to say old folks' home, but but uh, <laughs> they were sitting in their rocking chairs and reminiscing and and uh, one of them said to the other, we have been so blessed that so many good things have happened to us in our life. And they all nodded. And she said, but I'm sure there's some things that each one of us regrets. And she said, you know, I never finished college, and I wish I'd gone, gone to school. And so she looked at the other one, and she said, well, I never did get to travel. I would like to have gone to Switzerland. <clears throat> so when they looked at the third one, she said, well, never had a, never had a baby. And I wish I could have had children. And she said, well, you know, it's not too late in this day of all this technology and all this, these things. It's just, why don't you go to your doctor and check it out? And um, so sure enough, she found herself with child and uh, had a little baby girl. And so they, her two friends went to see her. They rang the doorbell of her apartment, and she came. And, and she said, come in. They said, we came to see the baby. And uh, she said, well, come in, and I'm fixing us some hot tea. So they came in, sat down, and uh, so a little while later, they were getting a little anxious, and they said, well, we really came to see the baby. And she said, well, I'm getting cookies out of the oven to go out the tea. <clears throat> and so they sat there a few minutes late, longer, <clears throat> and uh, just were insistent, said, we really want to see the baby. And she said, I know, but she's taking a nap, and I put her down, and I forgot where I put her. Well, that's the way she looks up. <laughs> So, <clears throat> I tell this story because I have a tendency to forget where I put the baby. So, <laughs> if I go wandering off into the peach orchard, just do the best you can. Because <laughs> I'm 76, and that's a whole lot to squinch down. And uh, so, and I never go out. Maybe talking in, in front of you is just a true test of faith for me because... When, on the morning that I'm going to talk, it always feels like my from above my eyebrows has just been stuffed with pink feathers. There's just nothing really. <laughs> like, but I've been prayed over. Um, and so it's like, you know, whatever. It's it's God's fault. But, uh, it earned it over. <laughs> oh, but I am an Alnon, and I'm grateful to be an Alnon because I don't take it just as a... Uh, Ne uh, really, I don't. Just being married to an alcoholic doesn't make me be an Aladon. And it's always just a... There's a page in there one day at a time that talks about taking offense. And I says, what we do, we take offense. And I do. I do it deliberately a lot of times. I take offense. And I usually let you know. And, uh, <laughs> but one of the things about taking offense is people that say, well, my mom's an alcoholic. Uh, my mom on an al Well, she's never been to a meeting. She doesn't have a sponsor. She doesn't know the steps from a hole in the ground. And I think, how could she be an al -Nan? Those were requisites, you know. <laughs> Just being married to an alcoholic doesn't necessarily. It's like the thing, you know, sitting in a garage doesn't make you a car. And so <laughs> there are some, there are some, <laughs> some things to do to be an al -Nan. And we have a, we have a list of them. You know, we're good at lists. And uh, <laughs> the thing is, uh, let's see. Where did I start a long time ago? I was born. We went into Hinton yesterday to the to have breakfast, have this huge breakfast, and then we had to find a garage sale. And Hinton's a little tiny town. It reminded me a lot of where I grew up in a little West Texas town that uh, had one paved street. And I remember it being safe and no, you know, no locked doors. And I can't remember bad things happening. I was thinking later about alcoholics, which was a word I didn't even, wasn't even in my vocabulary. They were uh, the town drunks, and there were three of them. And uh, they were always, but they were, the, they were nice men. One of them took the trash or the junk out of the junkyard. 
And after my mother had sort of sniffed, well, she'd let my brother and me ride with him on the uh, uh, the uh, wagon sometime. And uh, drugs, I didn't know anything about drugs. The only thing I heard was that they were in New York on the street and they were d dope fiends. And I never did, you know, it was only later that I found out about fiends, how you spelled it, but, uh, but anyway, it seems like right now a very innocent time to, to grow up. Uh, I was the firstborn, and later there would be three, three brothers. One I was two years younger, and then uh, when I was 17 and 18, uh, there were two little baby brothers that came along. And I married when I was 19, so my little brothers, and then I had children like Snap, Crackle, and Pop. It was just a... <laughs> <laughs> I went to college, and I was going to major in pre-med because... I'd been in the hospital so much with the uh, thing, so I thought I probably needed to do something worthwhile. And so, but I'll tell you, it was easier for me to have babies than it was to pass chemistry. And uh, so I married at 19, and uh, <laughs> Jack came back from, uh, people say, how did you meet Jack? Well, I never didn't meet Jack. We just knew each other. You know, and <laughs> when you live in a little bitty town, you just know each other. How do you know when you ever... Our, our um, parents belonged to the same bridge club for 25 years. And he uh, he and my cousin went right after Pearl Harbor, enlisted, and he was first lieutenant. And he looked... He was six foot four. Little tiny waist, and when they wore those Eisenhower jackets, and I thought he was just really... I thought he was really special looking. And I was 14, and he didn't even see me. And, uh, but when he came back, I was 19, and a few things had shifted, and I'm persistent. And, uh, so we were married just about three months later, and uh, had our, our first little boy a little too soon. And... Uh, <laughs> I am persistent. <laughs> like I said, it's easier to have babies than it was to do a lot of other things. <laughs> so we we married, and he had he told me when we got married that he liked to drink. And so anyway, I had made my mother told me she said, "Now when your husband asks you to go with him, you go. Dishes will wait, and beds will wait, but a husband may not." And I took her literally. I could beat him to the door, to the car, every time he mentioned to go. And later, when we came in the program, people would talk about, uh, said, Jack Clayton must really be henpecked, or he's got a DWI, because she's with him all the time. <laughs> well, I never did want him to find out he could go without me, so it just if, you, if you're there all the time, they don't know the other. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was determined, if he's going to have a drinking partner, and that partner is going to be a female, well, let me tell you, it was going to be me. <laughs> I was going to protect my property. <laughs> so, <laughs> we never did, there wasn't drinking in, in uh, my house. Mother kept a bottle of wine to soak the, what, fruitcake in, put, you know, a cup towel or whatever, soak it. That's all the, the liquor there was. My dad, would drink maybe once or twice a year, and people would ask me if uh, if my dad was an alcoholic, and uh, I don't know. I do know that every time he drank, something really bad would happen, and so he it was like if he was going to have liquor on his breath or even drink beer, he was. My mother was going to be very unhappy when he got home, so he might as well the one or two times a year just get really, you know, might as well pay for it. <laughs> and so one time there was a. Um, he and, and three other men went to a little neighboring town, and uh, the, the uh, I don't know what it was, deputy or whatever, stopped them, and it, somehow one of the, uh, the guy got trigger happy, and one of the men with my, my dad got killed. It was in the front page of the Lubbock paper and everything. And I didn't have, I didn't go through a lot of these, but I can think about kids whose, uh, whose parents are alcoholics, and the pain and the, and the, the shame that they do go through because I thought my life had ended uh, with that. So I would think about, you know, I, I don't sit, I'm not an analyzer. I got a lot of things more important to do than the navel gaze, so I'm not one to really analyze. So, but it was only later when one of our sons started drinking that uh, 
He didn't drink like Jack did. He didn't drink like I did. And then I could remember that uh, he sort of drank like my daddy did. He he drank. Uh, my dad would fight, and uh, when he'd get on one of these, and my son, he was coming home. I woke up one morning. I felt his eyes on me, and. Um, I woke up and here's my son sitting there and he says, do you think you could take me to the doctor? He says, I think I broke my hand. And he's broken his hand so many times. Uh, I always think protecting some girl's honor that hadn't had honor in a long time. <laughs> 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 he, <laughs> but he finally got mature enough or grew up or did something and I said, to, he hadn't fought in a long time. <laughs> so I, you do, we did grow up. And I think sometimes, I had my 40th Al-Anon birthday. I've been coming to Al-Anon since 1962. And um, I think sometimes, uh, don't an, overanalyze this one either, but am I weller than some by c continuing to come, or am I sicker than some by having the need to? <laughs> but whatever it is, I do still feel the need. There's still something deep within within me that needs, needs you, needs what I'm getting this weekend that fills up uh, places that I don't even know are empty until I get with you. And I see people that, uh, that I really and truly love, that I've some that I've known on this front row <clears throat> that I've known since the 60s and uh, when we first came in the program. And then there's some of you that I'm just, just meeting, the young ones, and I'm cultivating you because you can still drive at night. <laughs> and I need you. <laughs> but after we got married and had had uh, our two children right off the bat, and, uh, and like I said, Jack had told me that he, that he liked to drink. And so, and I was going to be that drinking buddy with him. So he was making $300 a month. And we went out to the bootlegger. We had a special bootlegger about six miles out of town. And paid $9 a fifth for, for whiskey. Now, proportionately, I don't know what that would be today, but we never did seem to lack the money for whiskey. And I had seen the pictures of Canadian Club in the, uh, you know, the sophisticated things with the girls. She always had on this one uh, sleeve dress and holding the long-stemmed glass. And it just looked really pretty cool. Well, we went out to the country and uh, would order. She, the bootlegger would come out to the car and ask what, what uh, kind of whiskey wanted. And she'd nod. And then she'd go out into the, to the field and count off so many rows, lived out on the farm, over and dig up whatever it was that ordered. She planted her whiskey out there because and it was hot. It was hot from the heat and then just hot. And so we'd take a Coke for me and take a, Jack would teach me how to take a swig of Coke and then a swig of, of liquor and then a, another swig of Coke. And this never did just fit that picture of uh, us. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, it took some, it took some practicing. <laughs> My mother never did understand uh, why we got such a nice fry pan from, from this woman. She said, why in the world is they sending you, is she sending you a wedding uh, present? And I thought, well, you know, Jack's helped build one wing of that house out, <laughs> out in the country. But the guys were coming back from World War II, and for the most part, marrying girls. And, and uh, Petersburg was little. It was about 500 people. Well, there's just not a whole lot of entertainment. They had a uh, movie on the weekends, but we had an American Legion Hall. They'd bought an old Methodist church that had moved on. It was like just like a basement. They never got the top part. But every Saturday night, the American Legion would have a, have a dance. So we'd go to dance, and I didn't know this, but it seemed to me that there was sort of an unwritten rule. You don't go home till all the whiskey's gone. At least we never did. But everybody <laughs> takes their own bottle, and uh, I found out later a lot of people did go home early, but not us. We're still there. But Jack, Jack was tall, and um, he'd kind of pass out of the picture about 11. And they had a big black leather couch, and he would lie in state 
after that. It's like, and I wasn't ready to go home as long as, but it'd take half the American Legion to help me take him home and get him out of the car and into the house. So then when he would ask me about the party, I said, you mean to tell me that you don't remember what happened? And because uh, I, I said, why don't you just take a few drinks and then take a sleeping pill? It just seemed to me like it'd be a lot cheaper, you know. Just <laughs> not going to remember anyway. So, but he never did buy that. <laughs> He'd say, do you mean to tell me that you remember everything you did? And I said, well, I certainly do. But really, and he said, well, Pat, if I were you, I wouldn't admit it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, he was quiet. He could sit up in a kitchen chair for just hours and pass out and not fall out. And, and we were, I was one of the ones that I liked to stay up late, and so we'd go wake up all the ones that hadn't gone to American Legion to the dance. You know, we'd go wake them up, wake the kids up and everything, to find out why they weren't there. So I was one that I danced on the tabletops. And, so, People would ask, ask me later, said, you know, do you think you're an alcoholic? And uh, we have always had these comparisons. And I did drink a lot. And I like drinking. I was, you know, it makes you prettier. And <laughs> to me, and I always felt it did to other people. But uh, <laughs> And to all of their drinking, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't all gloom and doom. We had p grandparents that took care of the the children while we were doing whatever it was we were doing at the American Legion Hall. <clears throat> Jack was called back into Korea. And so our marriage had gotten just really, we'd been married five years and had these two children. And it was, the moon was off the rose. I'm telling you, it was, uh, <laughs> he thought I spent too much money and I didn't think he helped me nearly enough. And I think he, I think it was sort of a relief to have a legalized battle in uh, Korea. <laughs> so he left and was gone for 15 months. And in this period, I really made some, some decisions and, and uh, some new commitments. I really wanted to be committed to my marriage. It really, one thing is that um, I hated standing in line for to get a license plate or whatever, and then get up there and find out you had to have the car title. And uh, all those things I had to learn, all those things I had to learn to grow up and because uh, I was I was very immature so when um, when Jack came home I really made a decision to uh, ask God to make well I wasn't talking to God those days so that's really an untruth I was just uh, if about my prayers were usually uh, beforehand and I was usually pray Lord, please don't let me be pregnant, pregnant and make it retroactive, please. You know? <laughs> so mostly they were just sort of, you know, <laughs> foxhole prayers. But I did make a commitment to the marriage. And one of the neatest things Jack ever said to me was uh, he wasn't a gift giver. This wasn't his, uh, his bent. But when he first got back, he said, Pat, I've always loved you, but I like you now. And that... That means a lot to me. Being in like is important because uh, I think you can love people and just not like them at all. And uh, <coughs> got an offer to move to Houston. Well, we did. And uh, he traveled a lot. So this was the, at a period of time when I got to wear those one shoulder dresses and we went to the to the clubs and everything. We were sort of the ambassadors because we we were known as the people could stay up late and party and take out the visiting, visiting firemen. He was gone more and more, and there began a discontent there that um, was to continue. And uh, so my dad had uh, run ele had grain elevators, and he mentioned one time that um, my brother, who was just younger than me, had been killed in a grain accident where the uh, walls of the elevator had collapsed and, and he was suffocated and there were just the two little boys so it just sort of started off jokingly you know about needing Jack to, to help him and I never was just real gung-ho on family businesses because I think they can get really kind of kind of messy sometimes and the drinking part and for us to move move to Lubbock so I wrote this long letter explaining 
I'm really good at explaining things. I just overshare on just about everything. And so I wrote out this uh, letter saying that we did drink and that I didn't want to have to, you know, be so careful to run behind the bottle when they came over. And this was sort of, you know, this was drinking wasn't done in my in my house. So anyway, we uh, we moved to Lubbock, and uh, the cardinal rule for the drinking for Jack had been to start at 5 o'clock in an 8 to 5 job, and he would not drink until 5 o'clock, or if he did, he wouldn't go to work. But mostly, he would wait until the secretaries had left and then open the bottom drawer of his desk and get out the bottle. Well, in the grain business, it's so seasonal that, um, you know, the 5 o'clock rule got bent, and he had a green and white ranchero. It was, I thought he looked so neat. He wasn't wearing a suit anymore. He was wearing khakis. He always had a flat stomach, and I just thought he looked so neat. He had a telephone in his uh, truck at that time, and that was pretty unusual. The only thing about it, he never did answer it. I couldn't keep up with him. I, and before, he'd stayed put at his office, and now he was no telling where. But in the, in the off seasons, there was a lot of gin rummy. And uh, playing, and we would still, we were still drinking together. He'd come by and get the bottle, and he was so considerate of me. He would always make me the first drink and make it very strong, because you can't, uh, you know, if you can't get them to join you, they're not going to be quite so grippy. I've been around a lot of women that come into Alan, and I'll tell you for sure, I can understand why their husbands drink. So, <laughs> There's just no doubt in my mind that they had a good reason. And so he was going to eliminate that part of our reason. He'd just get me going going first. And, uh, but he drank a, a, just about a fifth. And, well, I helped, but uh, when get down, he never did buy a lot. He'd just buy kind of a fifth at a time. And so when he'd get down kind of low, he'd always say, I better go to the liquor store before it closes because you're probably going to want another drink. <laughs> so he's very thoughtful and took, took good care of me. But then there came a time when, when um, I wasn't keeping up anymore. And he was just getting too far ahead of me. And I couldn't figure out what was, uh, what was going on. And one day, our youngest, we'd had a, a little boy in Houston. And a lot of our things about our life changed with this. We, we started doing more family things. We, were, we had Santa Claus again, and we started to... Uh, he, he brought a lot of uh, uh, joy in our life. And bless his heart, he's been a teacher. I'm, he's the one I call my spiritual sandpaper. And uh, he, he's kept me <laughs> honest and uh, aggravated and... Uh, probably can make me madder in three seconds, not even trying, that most people can work in real hard at it. But anyway, he came in one day, and he'd gone out in the pickup, and he'd brought in, his little arms were full of little half-pint bottles of vodka. And so then I, was, I began to understand why I wasn't keeping up. Jack would go and get a fifth, and then the vodka, and drink the vodka, because I wasn't stupid, you know, so that he'd know, and he'd just have a little bit out of the, out of the bottle drunk. And so I think the first thing that, that hit, so that hurt so bad was the lack of trust, you know, because I had been his, his drinking, but he had never hidden drinking from me because you can't hide something from somebody that's with you all the time. <laughs> I almost smothered their marriage with its togetherness. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, I know my heart just, uh, just sank because it, it was a whole different thing. And we talked about it periodically. Jack's dad was one of those... Uh, one of those three men in this little town that was the town drunk. And he was a neat man. He could uh, quote Socrates, Plato, and all those things. And his English was horrible. And everybody had a nickname. And Jack's name, well, he just loved this, but he's not here to defend himself. But Jack's real name was Crockett David. <laughs> he said, if you'd been called Crockett in the Army, you'd drink too. But uh, his dad started calling him a Jackson, smart Alec Jackson, and then got down to Jackson, and then Jack. So it's a complete name. But he named everything. Named his tractors, named his chickens, and uh, always, I was Patcher, and he always would tell me, he said, Patcher, you're my favorite daughter because you, you gave me the grands. And we had those three then. And when, he, when uh, Jack was in Korea, well, he was the, the father substitute, and uh, 
he ran a thrasher. I'm really going round and about today, so. <laughs> he ran an old thrashing machine, and he'd come by and get our little boy was about three then. And when I saw where he was taking him, I nearly died. He could have been killed 14 times before lunch at that thing. <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was a neat, gentle man. And we had seen a change in their lives because he was one of the town drunks and had been a source of shame and embarrassment to Jack and his brother and his mother. And uh, I had never seen Jack cry until one Christmas. They were supposed to come up and somebody came by and gave his dad a drink. And uh, I saw Jack cry because it just Christmas was just, you know, not going to be good. But he had found, he had found AA, and uh, their life had changed so much. And we went to meetings. We went to meetings in 19, this would be like 1948 or so, and Bill Wilson came to Lubbock. And, and um, the old time, I have some literature from, from then when I, it's called the Lubbock County Alcoholics Anonymous Auxiliary. And to see the change, because they, the arguing in their house, it was uh, always oh, just made me feel really bad. And I've heard it said that the sounds in, a, in an alcoholic home, the uh, harshness of the voice and, and the, the hurtful things that are said, and the change that had come about, and they still argued, they loved, they could just argue. It didn't matter which side, just choose the side and I'll take the other one. <laughs> they just liked that, but it was a different kind of, uh, it had a whole warm, warm tone about it. And this is one of the first things I sa uh, found out about me, is that sarcasm was one of my weapons. And uh, to try to disguise it, you know, with the, to sheath the, the uh, stiletto with the white velvet just before you stick it in, you know. <laughs> and uh, one of the pages in her outline talks about sarcasm literally, literally means the tearing of the flesh. And I was, I was really good at this. But I'd listen to myself when uh, I'd be yelling at my kids and the phone would ring. And you, you know, your voice just changes when you pick up the phone. You're not gonna be, you're not gonna continue this uh, horrible talking. And so I listen now to, to my voice. And when I really feel like I'm okay, I sound like chocolate fudge tastes to me. And when I'm not, it's like peanut brittle. It's, it's sharp and crackly. And so this is what I heard in their house, so the differences in the way they talked to each other, the tone, the whole tone. And we went to meetings with them. They had potluck suppers, and we'd go to those. And uh, his mom always took this same macaroni dish. You get traditions. You start them early, you know, like we go uh, at conferences. You know, you do something one time, and you start the tradition. you got to do it this way. So she always took the same dish, and we went and thoroughly enjoyed it. I remember the cleanness that I felt inside. And we were so thrilled that his dad had found this, uh, idea and his mom, this uh, serene feeling that we would go out and get drunk together to celebrate. <laughs> that, that was really, was really wonderful for them and uh, <laughs> for those folks that needed it. And uh, then the time was to come when we were, when we became those folks and we were still, you know, five people living in a house with very separate compartments. And like I said, I wasn't able to keep up now. The, the uh, drinking wasn't fun. I was still seeing it as fun. And even after we came in the program, I wasn't real sure I wanted Jack to quit drinking completely. I just wanted it to be back the way it used to be, the way I remembered it used to be. I don't think it ever was the way it used to be, but the way that I remembered it. Because uh, those of you that know Jack know he was a quiet person. He didn't talk a whole lot. So he had a partner one time, and they said, 30 minutes of uh, animated conversation between Jack and Forrest is 30 minutes of complete silence. And uh, so I thought, we won't ever talk again. And we sure probably won't ever have sex again if he quits drinking because uh, he was so inside, and I was so uh, such an outside person. And uh, I, we're... Here's so much about communication, and I thought we were communicating. I did. I just found out that I talked a lot, and he acted like he was listening. So we had a lot of 
a lot of learning to do about communication. And we learned a lot of it going, going to meetings. And uh, there was a, a little 12-step uh, house, is what it's called, and, and Bill Farley. And Bill Farley should have been dead any number of times. One day I went in, our youngest son, he went with us, and I'm sure a lot of people disliked that. <laughs> but anyway, I went in and he had one of those uh, Quaker oatmeal boxes, you know, the little round things, and he, he was, had his foot in it. He was walking around with that oatmeal box on his foot. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm playing like Bill Farley. Well, Bill Farley had been on the railroad track and had gotten the front part of his foot cut off, and he, he had to wear special kind of boots. <laughs> so this brings up a teaching point. You never know when you're going to be watched, so set a, set a good example if you can. <laughs> but uh, we went down there, and the things that I learned and the feelings that I felt and, and the love for these people and and uh, the one time we'd gone down there and it just been swept away by it. It, everything was a miracle then. And uh, we did talk. Our communication then was about the miracles and how exciting it was to. Uh, and uh, so we'd heard this man talk one Sunday night and just had touched us both so deeply. And then found out he left the meeting and went out and got drunk. And um, that's just a very hurtful thing because I think my feeling was you walk into AA or to al and it's just like, Sort of like the pearly gates of heaven. I didn't know that people had affairs after they came into the program. I didn't know that they didn't always tell the truth. And uh, and it, it was a surprise to find out that he could make this talk and then go out and get drunk. And I remember how he shook Jack up, and he called Bill Farley. And Bill told him, he said, Jack, it's not the miracle, or it's not the idea of him going out and get drunk. The miracle is when somebody comes in and stays sober. And um, the the norm would be to go out and get drunk. And one time, uh, we, uh, I don't think anybody ever told us we had a choice then. And you didn't have a choice of 90 meetings in 90 days either because there were not 90 meetings in 90 days. There was like a Saturday night uh, meeting and a Wednesday night meeting. And Jack and Johnny Brooks started a, a Monday night big book study. But um, we would had decided we'd go to a basketball game. And... Bill called Jack and asked him if he'd hold a meeting, and Jack said, Bill, I'd like to, but we're going to a basketball game tonight. And uh, Bill said, Jack, how many basketball games got you sober? <laughs> and Jack says, we'll be there. <laughs> and, so he's still saying we because I was with him. <laughs> and this is something else. The the uh, the smothering that I did was the, to learn. It's not an accident that in our al literature and books, that detachment has more readings than anything else. And it's, it doesn't mean that you get away from the person. It doesn't mean you stop loving it. It just means you, you start finding out that uh, you are individual and that you give each other the freedom. You know, the thing about the butterfly or the bird or whatever it is, you know, that if you hold it on your open palm and if it flies away, if it comes back, it's yours. And if it doesn't, it never was. But... Uh, Ramona, some of you know, remember Ramona, would talk about going to her uh, grandmother's farm and uh, the little chicken that she'd pick up and she was holding it too tight. And she said, you've got to have a, an open hand. And uh, why this is making me cry. Uh, I had to learn to love without just squinching on so tight because if it, if it goes away and doesn't come back, it never was yours anyway. Well, this is, this is mighty interesting. I never know. <laughs> Mine is so interesting to me. When, it is. When Jack died, well, you know, I would, uh, I could tell you about it. I could just talk to you and, and tell you things and be just real dried. And I'd go to the grocery store and, and the clerk would say, do you want paper or plastic? And I just burst into tears. <laughs> They just didn't any rhyme or reason, you know, so I never do, do quite know. They just come bubbling out and uh, <laughs> whatever.
Here's one. Let's see, I was talking about chickens and tears. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> we, uh, let's see, how did we get to Austin? Oh, uh, I know, I remember. Um, a Lubbock uh, guy was governor, and so one of the guys in the program, there was a um, department that never had been taken care of. I better, when did I, it's, oh, my watch is right. And anyway, they asked Jack to be the, uh, um, I can't even remember his title now. It was really important and, um, <laughs> in the insurance department. So we moved to Austin, and I just loved Austin. And I really felt like, you know, it was God-directed, except Jack was gone about every weekend for about the first three months, and I, and I got to wondering if God just meant for me to move down there. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, Austin, of course, it's like all of you have experienced when you've been in a program. We were in the program for nine years in Lubbock and, and felt warm and safe and we knew everybody and uh, they had a party every third minutes just let somebody have three days sobriety and somebody to have a party <laughs> for them and moved to Austin we couldn't get a phone didn't know anybody I knew one person and what saved me was uh, somebody said oh you need to meet Doris Doris had uh, worked in the uh, alcoholic ward of the state hospital because th this was before treatment centers and everything so she asked me if I'd like to be a volunteer. And I went one hour a week, and then I started going one day a week, and then I started going every day until noon. And I just loved it. I loved being around the the uh, alcoholics. They had to go through the the um, hospital part and uh, to be detoxified and everything and be, um, whatever you call it, had to be come in and sit down with the psychiatrist and the doctors and the counselors and they'd ask them, you know, do you know what day of the week it is? Who's your senator? And I thought, oh, they don't ask me. I don't even know today. But, <laughs> uh, but they'd let me sit in there and um, and I end up, I, this is just such a neat time for me. And she said a lot of times Alamans uh, know more or a lot about alcoholism but the alcoholics don't. And I think that's true because we remember it all. <laughs> But anyway, we started uh, in Austin, and they, they didn't do it right. You know, they didn't do it like they did in Lubbock. But I've been there now for 30 years, and uh, it's still, there are times, you know, I'd change it quite a bit. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I mean, I've lost the baby. I don't know where. We went to a lot of conferences. I know. I remember Austin. <laughs> yeah, I'm through with that. <laughs> Sharon, I'm gonna have to stir that. You're gonna have to stir the things down. To a lot of conferences, and so anyway, this was a part of our our, uh, our life. AA and Alan was our life. We did all these things, and um, I just always had. To, I'd gotten a sponsor after a while. When the pain got greater than the pride, well, I did ask for a sponsor. My sponsor was married to the person that Jack asked to be his sponsor, and I just had really had an aversion against because I had I had uh, <coughs> drunk with Jack and and I liked it and. Uh, and I like alcoholic women, and like I said, I've seen some Alanons that I can see why their husbands drink, and some of them were just so good, they just about made me sick. And I just never could. She said, I don't like to be called sweet, and I just don't like sweet women. And so some of them, I was so determined that uh, goody good women just would really turn me off. So I just thought, I'm, I don't want to be like that. So I'd sling out a four-letter word every now and then. <laughs> So, you wouldn't get the impression that I was too good. So, we went to Cedar Glen one year, and I just had this sort of spiritual explosion down there. And I went crying all weekend, and things had just been opened up. And so, I talked to Octavia, who was my sponsor, and I said, Octavia, you know, I'm just really worried that I'm just, you know, this is happening to me, and that I'm just going to get too good. 
And she said, Pat, you got a lot of things to worry about, but getting too good ain't one of them. <laughs> so, I don't, uh, I, I don't have this trouble today, you know. <laughs> but I can't imagine what my life would be like if I didn't have, uh, if I didn't have people like, like you are here this weekend that have loved me and you've hugged me. When uh, Jack found out he had, had lung cancer, and we had another uh, road to to walk. A lot of you, a lot of you in this room walked it with me and came and, and uh, gave me comfort. And it was about the time that uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, I remember Vinoy had flown in, and we were sitting in the kitchen. Here came a bunch from Norman, <laughs> some ungodly hour of the morning, and uh, still uh, talking about O.J. and part of them, didn't think he was guilty at all, and and uh, but anyway, you went you went with me and you stayed with me and you sent flowers and cards and and uh, I remember the day that we went in and uh, the doctor had told Jack that uh, there was just a a short time left to live, and you had taught us so well about living one day at a time that we could do it. We could just do today. So when we left, he said. Uh, what do you want to do? And I said, Jack, I don't know. I never have, never have done this before. And one another one of Paige and our Aldon books says this woman was brought bad news by her priest or whatever. And her mother had told her, you know, you do whatever it is that you'd be doing if this hadn't happened. And I said, well, I have uh, coupons, two for one to go to Red Lobster. And he said, let's go. <laughs> so we went, and and that's. The way we were able to do it was just that, um, that those little days at a time. And he had helped start a group over at Mom's <coughs> Kitchen. And this was the last thing he wanted to give up, and I took him. I was still going with him, but it wasn't with such a tight rain now. And I, I love going to AA meetings. I always try to, you know, help them out all I can. <laughs> <laughs> They don't pay any more attention to me than Jack did, but uh, <laughs> uh, so we'd go to Mama's kitchen, and uh, sometimes we'd have to leave early. But uh, hospice came, and, and uh, there were still meetings. People came to the house, and they gave me the gift of rest. They would stay; somebody'd stay at night, and I'd hear just subdued noises because my bedroom door was closed. I could be to the bed in four seconds, but I'd smell bacon frying at two or three o'clock in the morning and somebody was there. And uh, finally, uh, one of the things that, if any of you heard Jack talk about surrender and, and um, pride, finally the time came when I, I said, Jack, it's really time for you to surrender. And um, I did not fall apart. You know, you had taught me how to be whole, how to know that uh, after being married for 48 years, well, I was going to miss him, but I wasn't going to die without him. You taught me how to live a life and that um, we weren't hooked together with our umbilical cords. And one woman asked me, I just I had a wreck not long ago and towed my car and had to go buy a new one. And this one woman, she said, well, I've got to get a car and I'm going to talk to Cecil about it. Well, Cecil's been dead for several years. <laughs> <laughs> she asked me, she said, do you talk to Jack about things like that? And I thought, Lord, no, if a voice came out, I'd, I'd still be running. <laughs> but we had enough togetherness that I still remember the special things. And, um, I said the other night that uh, one of the four-letter words in our house was pride. And Jack talked about pride a lot. And uh, about that he felt like he felt like it was at the base of every character defect there is, even, even fear. We never did completely agree about that. But uh, I had gone to conferences. I'd gone to women's conferences. And I had um, learned to, uh, that I was going to miss him. There wasn't going to be a day I didn't. But I wasn't going to. I wasn't just going to curl up and die, and that the need for al -Anon was still just, just very great for me because I have eight grandchildren. One of them's in prison, and one of them's just come back from Kuwait as captain in the Marines, and he's tall and handsome. And um, 
the statistics are going to show that if, if all eight of them get by unscathed by the disease of alcoholism, that'll be pretty rare. Right now, I don't see any. I don't know that there are symptoms, but I'm not around them. This is one way I think God uh, keeps me <laughs> humble and work in the program is that he doesn't let them be too close to me. The one that's my spiritual sandpaper lives in Austin. And uh, all of a sudden, he's just, he's just got, he's like, acts like my mother now. He calls, he's worried that I'm not eating properly. And uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, when, uh, this is sort of an aside, but anyway, we took Jack's ashes out to uh, where we lived, and it was after Christmas, we waited till then, and it was just dreary and cold. It was not a good experience. It wasn't one of those, uh, you know, chill, bumpy, neat times. It was bad. And uh, so when we got back, everybody was exhausted. Our teacher could, I mean, our daughter couldn't land because the weather was so bad and everything. When we got back to Austin, Kyle looked at me and he said, Mom, when you die, you mind if we just FedEx you? <laughs> and, and, you know, Uh, today, just in a, just a short time, my family is going to be getting together to celebrate my mother's 99th birthday. And she's the neatest lady. She's uh, she just dresses up, and she still takes care of all of her business stuff. And and uh, she's just a neat person. And when I'm asked, who are the uh, your role models? I have a bunch. I have a bunch. A bunch of them are sitting here in this room that I I watch you. Um, I went. I, I've told this story so many times, but I went to the first women's conference. I don't know whether this is to be told in front of guys or not. <laughs> uh, anyway, I was rooming with Benoit. And, uh, so anyway, we watch each other put on makeup and, and do these things, you know. And so she put on pantyhose without panties. <laughs> and I hadn't been doing that, you know. And... Uh, so I thought, well, you know, that makes sense, because why are they called pantyhose? And so, you know, and I said, I never would have learned that. Jack Clater never could have taught me that. And, and I thank God for that. But, but anyway, there's a lot of people that come on in on my side of the fence that have... Uh, let men, they've tried to let men teach them how to be women. And they can't do it because they don't know how. So women teach women how to be women. And we've learned to be more feminine and that you don't have to be tough to be gentle. And this is one of the things that uh, that you've taught me, that I like being a girl. I like having you open the door for me. And I, when a guy opens the door for me, I say, oh, I appreciate a gentleman. And he, you know what he always says? He always says, you know, my mama just shoot me if she saw me walking in front of you, and I think, yay, mothers do have a purpose. <laughs> I just love the name of your, con I mean, the, the uh, theme of your, whatever it is. <laughs> it's about purposes. <laughs> purpose, what is it? We'll be like, happy and joyous and have a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about ready to wind down. I think I'm just beginning to talk about This is just one more thing that I talked about. I just got sick of people telling me to look at my motive. I just got sick of the word motive. I had to have a word to fit in, and I never could fit in motive. It just didn't work. But purpose does. You know, when you say, what was the purpose of your doing that? I can use purpose, and I'm not trying to rewrite the program, but uh, to have a purpose. And I guess that's why I keep coming back, and why I need to come back is because I do have a purpose. I have a woman crazier than a bed bug calling me and telling me that her 50-year-old son won't move out. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell her you need to go down on. And she said, "Well, they smoke." And I said, "Well, find another group, you know." And I'm not, I'm not too patient, you know. But they've got to be very low maintenance these days for me, <laughs> for me to, to, to sponsor them. But this quick story, and I'll I'll make it down about the two uh, about the two seas that are fed from the same the same water, and one of them you see, and it's just got 
kids playing and people having picnics and fish jumping and the butterflies abounding and everything. And here's this other one that's been fed by the same water over here and it's sitting here stagnant and dull. There's nothing growing. There's nothing alive. There's no <coughs> trees or grass around it. And the difference in the two seas, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, is that the Sea of Galilee takes it in and pushes it out, takes it in and gives it away. And the Dead Sea just takes it in and keeps it. And I get a picture sometimes, and let me tell you, I don't want to be a Dead Sea. So whatever you all are giving me, I'm going to give it right back because I don't want to get stagnant. So that's the reason I still have a committed meeting. That's the reason I still need to do the things that I need to do. Slowed down a lot, but anyway, whatever I'm doing, I do have a purpose. And one of my purposes today is to let you love me, and I thank you that you do. Woo!